false witnesses who would also try to trip the people up because they would, once the moon was sighted, two witnesses came in, the Sanhedrin decided, okay, it's true, we have officially, we can officially declare Tishri 1, the, the new year, Rosh Hashanah has started, we can blow the trumpets, um, and, and they would light fires. I mean, this is the whole thing, and they would light fires all up and down the coast, and it would just spread like wildfire, this whole knowledge that, that this, the new year is starting. But, the, you know, it could get very messy because you could have, in a time of war, you know, so there's two other, couple other elements. This is where, this, that's why it's just fun to dig all these different nuggets out of this. And, the, and like a crystal, like cut, just turn a little bit more and get a little different angle of the way the light's refracting. And you see that sort of truth out there. But one of the things is, it, 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 when you blow the trumpets, it can signify either a solemn assembly, or it does. That's why we're going to come together tomorrow. So if you're around, anywhere around us, come on out to Cornerstone and we're going to blow the shofar. We're going to sound the trumpets and we're going to do our part. Because I do think, and let me say this again, this whole concept of, oh, the Christians keep Torah, whatever. I'm not. Jesus said at the Passover, when he's having the Passover and he knows he's the Passover lamb and he's laying down a framework now, he knows that this is the foundation for the next administration now as, as he dies and is resurrected and the last two days are going to be going to play out now he's going to be getting ready and bringing in the final harvest he tells him do this in remembrance of me see and because he knows and again that uh, the temples raised in 70 AD and there's no longer a physical temple or even a city now in which to officiate officially as a nation, these festivals. See, this has been always been a problem for the Jews. So he, understanding a lot of this, the prophecies, is telling them to do this in remembrance. See, we're supposed to practice the feast now in remembrance. So we, in remembrance of their prophetic significance. The fact that we haven't been doing it, we've been doing Santa Claus and, and, and Easter eggs. I mean, I'm just like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. I have a lot of personal to repent of. I mean, there is the sins, the blood of Jesus covers all our sins of ignorance, but, well, that's another whole topic. What are we going to do? What are we going to do, Lord? We have to cry unto the Lord um, for some answers here, but we can keep the remembrance of these things. So this became a very strategic feast in Israel. Now, let me just say a couple of the things about this. This is what is so interesting to me. This is where it ties into a lot of the words that Jesus and Paul had. And, you know, we've explained the part about, you know, you don't know the day or the hour. Well, because it's talking about the Feast of Rosh Hashanah, when you don't really know when you're going to see the new moon. You have to be watching and waiting. It is a feast of absolute readiness. It has a mystery about it. because, And if it is tied in to the return of the Lord... It's a fe it is a complete feast of faith. The only reason you would be watching and waiting and anticipating is, and, and it says that there is a crown of righteousness laid up for those who love his appearing. I love the Lord. I can't wait for Jesus to, to come back. I mean, there's no other hope for the world. I mean, I don't know whatever else you think. There is no hope. We need our, our Savior, our Lord and Savior to come. It's time. So, and there's a special reward for those who love his appearing. So I'm not at all ashamed to say that and to anticipate it and to teach about it and try to get people excited about this. But um, this is why in the first, it's, it's a, it became a two-day feast, and it was purposely done this, because in the two days, you know, the first day you have to do it on faith. By the second day, it's a fate complete, and you can actually practice the feast. Well, that's sort of like our faith. You know, he says, those that love me will obey me. Okay, so in, if, if many people say they love the Lord, but they don't obey him. <laughs> and, and this is what he says. He says, you know, he will spew the lukewarm out of his mouth. If you love me, you will obey me. And I can't say it any simpler. I mean, it means what it says, and it says what it means. 
So part of this understanding of, of practicing the feast, being anticipatory, being ready, this whole parable of the virgin with oil, those some that have it and some that don't, if you're still in the world, loving the world, hoping that, oh gosh, we don't know the day or the hour, that's a great way to say, I can put it off, I don't have to really live, you know, live my faith. I don't have to really, I can live one world, you know, one foot in the world. I can love mammon. and I can build a whole life for myself. I can just love the fact that you're looking down the road, having grandchildren and, you know, getting a bigger house and getting a better job and, you know, whatever, you know, and not loving his appearing. See, this is a snare. This verse has been a great snare and a lot of false doctrine has sprung up around it. But either way, now, let me go on to say this, um, that this concealment, okay, so there's a whole onion layer to this thing, that in physics, there, because, <laughs> and I can't get into this, the more I understand this, when Jesus comes, okay, and the dead are raised, okay, and, and those who are alive will be changed, as Paul said, it is called the resurrection rapture. I do not believe in any extra secret catching away of Gentile Christians separate and divorced from our brothers, the house of Judah, the nation of Israel over there, the restoration of all things. We are one big uh, storyline here, okay? We're connected. Now, we don't understand that we are, and that doesn't even matter what we think. We are, okay? There's only one Israel of God. It's all the Old Testament saints. It's the, our house of Judah brethren over there in the land. And when I say that, I mean Benjamin and Levites, all those that are attached, and all the other tribes that have been coming back, and all the other Gentiles, whoever's attached themselves to this thing in faith all is, is part of this thing. We're in this thing together. And there's so many prophecies about the restoration of all Israel in the last days. Now, that's another whole teaching I can't get into. But... This concept that we are a little, we have a separate destiny and we're a separate entity and God's going to do a whole separate thing with us Gentile Christians could not be more wrong and more unhebraic. Un Satan is a divider of brethren. The Lord is a uniter. We are all together in this thing, in this story, in this drama. We have different prophecies. We are in two houses, the house of Israel and the house of Judah right now, in, in, and, I won't, and I have teachings on that on my YouTube channel. Go in and start to check it out. But in physics, there is a law known as Heisenberg's The Uncertainty Principle. Because this concealment is, in essence, when you really study about Jesus and the resurrection rapture, which is what I call it. So the dead are going to be resurrected. Uh, cause, and the, if you're alive, I have a body and I have a soul already. It belongs to Yahweh. I just need to be changed. So that's what it means. And then we will be caught up in the air. Now, we got it doesn't say we're going to be going to some distant planet or we're going to go up to the throne room of God. It doesn't say that. It says we're going to meet him in the air. And the air, my voice, my hands are in the air right now. This is, I don't think we have to understand these things a little more Hebraically. Hashem, it isn't even the word going to meet him in the heavens. It's not even the word in the Greek. It's the word air. This is a whole different spin. But in physics, there's a, there's a law known as Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. It states that if you know the position of a subatomic particle, you cannot know its speed. If you know its speed or velocity, you cannot know at the same time its precise location. See, because I've been doing some teachings on dualism and understanding now the whole subatomic world, which is the world of our soul, which is what's at stake. This has nothing to do really with the body. Um, what's at stake is our souls. And where you are, where your soul is, on the day of Rosh Hashanah, when the last trump is called and the roll is called up yonder, that will determine where you go. If you two are in the field, one is taken and one remains. This is, this is the popular teaching that that's a rapture. No. This is where the subatomic, the quantum level, but let me just say two more things before I wrap this up. Okay, so there's this concept, which I think is really interesting, because it gets into this whole thing of the quarks. They can never understand. Like, these things just, I've heard my son talk, who's, uh, well, he's a chemist, but knows a lot more science 
that I'll ever know. Okay, but I can understand, grasp these things in a, in a very large concept. Um, we can't figure, there's no rhyme or reason to them. We can't figure out what they're doing. On some, but see, I think this has a lot to do with the hiddenness of God. His work is hidden, and a lot of it has to do with free will. You don't, even you don't know the choices you're going to make moment to moment. Now, the Lord does, so he's got everything already. If you pick door A, B, or C, even Satan doesn't know what you're going to do. Only the Lord knows ultimately what your next move, your next thought, and your next breath is going to be. And he's got all the bases covered. That's why I don't think they're ever going to really figure it out. And this is on purpose, by design. But there is a thing called the many worlds uncertainty that goes, that's part of this Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. It says the many worlds interpretation, which is now what a lot of string theory, a lot of people understanding that there really are and can be many dimensions to this thing. Many world or many realms interpretation, uh, I don't get to understand, who's govern, who, whose distribution is governed by wave functions and the Schonenberg equation. Like, I mean, they had all this math in this stuff. I mean, I'm sorry, I am, I am dumb. There are areas of my brain that are just, I was behind the door <laughs> when a couple things were passed out, but that was one of them. The uncertainty in the many worlds interpretation follows from each observer within any universe having no knowledge of what goes on in the other universes. See, I, I really believe, and I can't, that this is all sort of tied in. Um, this is why, you know, you don't know. Uh, you have to really be watching and waiting and paying attention. You cannot be a foolish virgin. You cannot be lukewarm. I'm telling you what, because when it's go time, when God... You know, you, it is what it is. He says the door will be shut. And you're not going to be able to get into that next realm in the air, wherever it is, okay? You know, you shouldn't have been playing Candy Crush all this time. <laughs> you should have been in the Word of God, feeding your soul, getting your light turned on. Okay, then there's a last thing called free will as part of this has suggested that this uncertainty principle we're talking about, that, that at least the general nature of quantum mechanics could be evidence for the two-stage model of free will. In other words, they, th this is what I said, like, we don't even know what our next move is going to be, and we don't even know what the circumstances around us are. I mean, you could go outside and get hit by a truck. I mean, it, it, right? God forbid that should ever happen. But I'm saying we just don't really know. There is all this uncertainty. And this is all tied up in this whole idea of this feast. It's a feast of concealment, and nobody knows the day or the hour, but it is a feast of watching and of ready men uh, to be ready to participate. Now, let me quickly go on to a few other things here, because I've got to say something. So Paul is saying, because there's a couple of these parables that Jesus, when you understand this in terms of the feast, it all makes sense. Jesus says um, that the Thessalonians, let's trust this word from Thessalonians 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 5, but concerning the times and seasons, brother, which is another way of saying concerning the feasts and the holidays, Okay, that's what times and seasons, that's the word mohadim, oh, now my Hebrew is going to escape me, and seasons, moed and moedim, okay, those are the Hebrew words. You need no, that I should write you, for you yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, for they will say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, not you, he's saying, on them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. See, remember, and Jesus makes an that, that the labor pains, okay? But you, brethren, it all makes, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Uh, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We're not of the night or of the darkness. I've always said this. It's not going to take me by surprise. I'm waiting. Oh, my gosh, if we're out there blowing the, the shofar tomorrow, tish, and we get changed, I mean, praise the Lord. He's always said it was going to be a small remnant. Well, whatever. Let God be true and every man a liar. And I'll just say anybody, wherever you are, if in your heart of hearts you love the Lord and you love his appearing, the Thessalonians were keeping the day, holy days correctly and understood the meaning of each day. Each holy day represented a part of the Father's plan for mankind. All these feasts have laid out the whole story of salvation. Um, now, it says the evil servant were those who would, did not obey Yahweh or his Torah. 
They didn't get it. We'll not know the day or the season. This is the feast days. This has to do. But you know, this is why Jesus said, even to the, there's enough other kind of signs. Even though if you're not, and I don't want to put a guilt trip on anybody. I mean, to me, this is a feast that I can have all this understanding, and it's free. I mean, I, I'm just all over it. But the, the flip side is you can see the signs of the times. There's so many of them. Wars, rumors of wars, and, you know, just um, the lawlessness, just everything else that's going on. The rise of the Antichrist, this whole, the, 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 the mark of the beast, all these things are all signs. So there's, a lo there's enough, <laughs> that there's no reason to be asleep. Um, because they won't be keeping the holy days at the correct time or the correct day. The good servant will have made themselves ready, which is, again, this alludes to the virgin who has oil in her lap and is waiting for the bridegroom, because this is the, there's another illusion in this, the feast. This is the last thing, I one other understanding I have to give, the trumps, okay? There's three trumpets blown during the different feasts. There's a spring trump i forget what it's called i don't think it's called the first trump but there's the 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 last trump this feast the the trump that's blown at this feast is called the last trump that's why paul says at the last trump and at the sound of the archangel you know again it's not like just because we're going to be blowing a shofar that's not the last trump and it also it says in other writings at the voice a tautology because i did teach on the tautologies last week i hope you understood or last time understand at the trump of god at the voice of the archangel so we know that this is again the same alluding to the same thing when the angels are told it's go time go and get the harvest and put them in my barn get the good wheat put it in my barn okay so the evil servant when two will be in the field, you know, one will be taken and put in the barn. One is going to have to stay in the field for the judgments, for the wrath of God. I'm sorry, that's, that's what we're talking about. Um, the good servants will have made themselves ready. Their garments for the wedding will have been washed white and pressed and laid aside, ready to be put on at the exact hour. So when we hear, and I don't, know how, you know, I don't plan, even pretend to have all understanding. I'm just beginning to be able to wrap my mind around some of this stuff. So, uh, but I'm listening. I'm not looking. I am listening intently for, for the Lord, for the sound, for the voice of the archangel, for uh, things that will tell me greater insight and possibly, you know, getting me to meet the Lord in the air. Read Matthew. Get yourself ready. The servants who were, uh, let me see. So what are we talking about? It is the Feast of Trumpets. This is the day the Messiah is to return. Even into Hebraic understanding, this is the day Yahweh was born in 3 BC. Um, this is the day that Adam was created. Jesus is the second Adam. I mean, it all fits. God's very orderly. Once he creates a typology, this is the beginning of, he said, you blow the trumpets. They were blown um, at the beginning of this age. And they will be blown at the end of this age, the 6,000-year Adamic age, before we go into the Millennial Kingdom. Now, I do believe that this is the feast where the elect of God will be called up yonder. So, maybe it's this year, maybe it's next year, maybe it's some. Um, but I absolutely believe with all my heart, it is in our lifetime. We are in the zone. There is not a lot of time. Um, what can I say? Now, I just want to go over a couple more verses. Uh that I touched on, and let me reiterate a couple of these points. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15, because I do want to say, last point, let me go to Revelation before I do this, because this thought did come in. You know, I don't teach a lot out of Revelation. I don't know if ever, anybody ever noticed. I mean, I'm aware of it. I read it. But even understanding the parabolic language and the sod understanding of things, it's been said, I've said this before, there were over, the learned sages will say over 70 sod encrypted understandings in here so there's so much hidden imagery <laughs> and that's part of a problem people just read this thing and they, they just start making it up but i will say that in uh revelation 20 because we do have another thousand years to go we have the millennial reign or the sabbath rest for the people of god see for me it'll be time of rest for the saint of god who is going to become and I believe, well, let me read this, and then I'll give my commentary. 
Revelation 20, Satan is bound in the first verses for a thousand years. Then he sees thrones. John the Revelator is shown thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I heard the souls of those who had beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus. And I think that's going on in the world today. I mean, I wouldn't make all of my end time theology on this verse of beheading. I don't think every saint of God's going to get beheaded, but I think this is an indication that some saints are going to be, be, be being headed at this time. And I think, what do we have going on to much of our church, our Coptic brothers and sisters um, over in the land over there? I mean, this is crazy. It's so literal. The word of God. They are beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. I have a whole different understanding of this. I mean, eventually Satan might try to force some microchip on you, but I, it, it's so much deeper that it has your ha your head and your hand is like your body and your soul. It's like, where are you at? What are you doing? Okay, you know, no man, I can't look at you and read your mind, and I can judge you by your actions, but I have to be careful that I judge righteously. Okay, so there's a little tricky business there, but. The forehead is, is a Hebraic understanding of your mind, and your hand is what you do to work, what you're doing, okay? So there's always a dualism going on of your heart, uh, your mind, your soul, and your, your work, your physical manifestation, what you're doing. And then it's really even for out of the heart are the issues of life, because it's really out of the mind that things are conceived either for good or for evil. So I, I, I tend not to be... I do give that a much more parabolic understanding, first and foremost. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This is the millennial reign. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now that's the promise to the righteous from, from Adam on, okay? This was the promise. Okay, Adam, I know you, Houston, we have a problem. I'm going to solve it. It's going to take 6,000 years. And he always said that the, the righteous, those who would live toward, who would, who would love truth and righteousness, um, would have a stake in the world to come. Okay? This is this understanding, but it is the first resurrection. So all these other things that we've been talking about, these are harvests in this prophetic year or this prophetic age. At this point... Um, this will be the first resurrection. Then it says the rest of the dead will not be raised until the thousand years is up, and then they will be raised, and they will be judged according to their works, you know, and that's another whole story. But let's, let me just finish with this. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that those who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Let me just say this too. In Hebraic understanding, falling asleep means died. Okay, they're not asleep. They're asleep in the ground. And, and, you're, and really, your soul, it's kind of an idea of, of um, you know, putting a computer program kind of on, on sleep. Okay, this is exactly what it means. You're dead. You don't have a body. You can't function in this realm anymore, technically. <laughs> okay? Um, so... We are, those that are alive and remain to my, are those who will be changed. I don't like the word rapture, but I do have to use it because there is a little bit of an allusion to the gathering together to meet him in the air. Okay, so remember I said air. Uh, so those are the, that's me, I, I hope, my best hope is that I am changed. Uh, but there's many of us that will be and have been since Christ's first resurrection are now dead. And so they will not precede those who have died in this two-day window. The rest of them are already up in paradise with him and will be coming with him. Those are the armies that he brings with him. It's really very simple when you begin to understand. Put it, ah. But for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. This is referring uh, with the voice of the archangel with the trumpet of God. Who's going to get to blow the shofar on the day, on the final day of, uh, on the feast of, of Rosh Hashanah on Yom Terah, the day of shouting, then the Lord, 
I mean, why? I would think that he's at the head of his army. He's the one who gets to blow the shofar, truly. the one that, and, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. And there is the whole wedding feast here and the whole, there's other parts of this thing. Never make your complete understanding or your complete theology on one verse. Yep. He says, it is, truth is in the sum of all his words. All these, you have little pieces of this puzzle, but that's a great one. So to my opinion, there's no secret rapture. So if that's what you're looking for, because I'll tell you what, you go Google what's called Project Bluebeam, because Lucifer has a whole fake rapture plan for Christians who want to stick with that. You know, you get, you reap what you sow, you get what you want. So, okay, now... Um, we already went through 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. So you had Christ, the first fruits, those that are Christ that is coming. That's what we're coming up right now. And then again in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. We will not all be changed. We will not all die but we will all be changed. It's exactly, and see, that's the physics of it, and that's why I think it is a mystery feast, and it does have to do, like I said, with this, even in quantum figures, they can figure there's a little, there's some a little, um, little weird about this. We can't pin this thing down. We can't pin down exactly what people are going to do, where they're going to be, you know, the whole subatomic thing. There is a mystery to it. Um, and the, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, and we will be changed. For this perishable, this, this, more, this corruptible body has to put on incorruptibility, actually, and this mortal must put, put on immortality. One refers to your body needs to put on, um, it's corruptible, needs to put on incorruptibility, and your, your perishable, the soul, which can be, this, it must put on imperishable. You have to be completely cleansed. All the viruses have to be gone out. So with that, I just want to say, uh, if you are in this area, come to the back of Cornerstone Bookstore. Let's blow the shofar tomorrow. Let's have a festival in remembrance, a prophetic. Let's do a prophetic act in our area. Let's tell the Lord that we love his appearing and we are not ashamed of him at his coming. And with that, I just want to say good night, God bless, and I hope I see you in the air.